Good morning, dear students. Welcome to the um, Institute of English Studies at the University of Warsaw. We have a little tradition here that uh, each year, at the beginning of the academic year, one of the professors um, gives a little talk to the first year students uh, about something they are interested in and something they would like to share. And uh, what I would like to share with you today is a little talk about Queen Victoria in advertising. Uh, if you are interested, you can actually go to the library of the Institute and uh, read the book I wrote about it a few years ago. It's in Polish, so um, those of you who are not Polish speakers uh, can read something else. For example, several volumes of the conference um, proceedings of a wonderful conference we've been having at the university, uh, at the institute here, called From Queen Anne to Queen Victoria. And uh, here I have volume three. And the talk I'm going to, to give is based on, uh, um, on a paper I gave during this, uh, this conference. So if you would like to read what I am uh, going to uh, to say, or read more about it, uh, check the uh, the books that I am going to quote from. Uh, this is the uh, the volume to consult. So from Queen Anne to Queen Victoria, volume three. Okay. So um, Queen Victoria in advertising, as you can see her here uh, on one of the uh, on one of the ads for uh, citrus fruit imported citrus fruit uh, called Victoria brand. So Queen Victoria becomes a brand at the end of the 19th century. Um, some of you may be familiar with the celebrity status of the modern British royal family, including the Queen herself. I found a few um, examples here. Uh, we have uh, um, an advertising from a, a media platform um, referring to different famous people, uh, politicians mostly of, uh, of the world and uh, one of these uh, people is actually Queen Elizabeth II. We have uh, quite a lot of examples of the humorous tweet treatment of Queen Elizabeth. Um, some of you may be familiar with the um, with the um, humorous uh, TV series like The Windsor, uh, The Windsors, or the recent quite controversial The Prince, making fun quite unashamedly of the uh, of the royal family, and uh, you might ask yourself when did it all start? And actually, it starts. Well, in the 18th century, in terms of making fun uh, of the royals, but uh, in terms of advertising and unashamedly using the celebrity status of the royal family um, for commercial gain, among other things, it really starts with Queen Victoria. And uh, the first quotation comes from the uh, Victorian book by a political commentator, Walter Baker, and uh, the title of his book, written in 1867, is The English Constitution. And in this book he complained, and you have the quote on the, um, on the screen, secrecy is essential to the utility of English royalty as it is now. Its mystery is its life. We must not let daylight upon magic. So he believed that there is some special status um, of the royal family, the royal blood, the queen herself, of course, uh, and that this was in danger of being made too common, too mundane. And actually, when he was writing this, the queen had been absent from the public scenes for many years, secluded from view after the death of her husband, the prince consort, Prince Albert. Yet she was there on coins and postal stamps, as well as on mass-produced lithographs and photographic prints. Since the first occasion when a royal sitter posed for a photographic portrait, the magic had been fading. But was it really a threat? So um, <clears throat> before the invention of photography in the first half of the 19th century, um, how people 
knew the faces of the of the royals of the monarchs so there were coins there were portraits but not many people could see them perhaps some of the some of the portraits were um, available to be seen uh, in museums or art exhibitions but they weren't made they weren't printed in many copies there was uh, illustrated press so press illustrations um, were probably the most um, familiar way to use uh, to, to see the royal faces but with uh, photography it really starts to change you have some early examples of uh, of um, photographs showing the uh, the royal couple uh, actually prince albert was very interested in everything modern in uh, technologies and commerce and um, the moment that photography became available as a technological novelty he was one of the first uh, titled sitters to pose for a, for a photographic portrait. Uh, Queen Victoria as you can see um, followed and here we have um, one of the early photographic portraits of, uh, of Queen Victoria uh, with uh, one of her children the eldest uh, the eldest daughter also called victoria but uh, um, this really opened the floodgates so victoria and albert were very often photographed and the prints were circulated in literally hundreds of thousands of copies so from one photographic negative you could make uh, an immense number of prints and these prints were sold and collected and uh, towards the end of the 19th century there was hardly any household in the entire vast British Empire that wouldn't have some sort of likeness of the Queen so everybody knew her face but if you look at the way that they were photographed they were very often photographed in middle class clothing so no crowns no special gowns and thrones and all the regalia that would make it obvious that the sitter was the queen she looks like a middle class lady wealthy but not divine not the queen by grace of god and also unlike the official portraiture the new invention of photography at least before the perfecting of the retouching process in the in the 1880s was unflattering candid and profoundly democratic so the queen was portrayed the way she really was she wasn't the prettiest woman ever to sit on the thrones of um, of europe but uh, uh, she was recognizable so um contrary to the objections of some of the uh, that some of the pictures were too personal the democratizing potential of the photograph was an important factor contributing to its popularity the public felt empowered by the newly gained access to the private details of the queen's daily life uh, here we have another quotation from a book a very interesting book by john plunkett called queen victoria first media monarch so uh, he writes that the realism of royal photographs gave uh, them, the, the photographs, a de demythologizing equality at the same time as they created an intimate familiarity with the royal, um, with the royal family. So they made outsiders witnesses to what was quintessentially private or even painful events like those surrounding victoria's widowhood it is very difficult to say to what extent the queen was ever able to control the reproduction of her photographic image but its dissemination really worked to her benefit uh, so the public loved her even in her widowhood when she was depressed when she was uh, withdrawing from the public life uh, the fact that the public could see her photographs made them sympathize with the queen and actually she returned she returned almost well a decade after the death of prince albert uh, in 
1872, after the Prince of Wales recovered from a life-threatening illness, Victoria participated in the Thanksgiving ceremony at St. Paul's Cathedral uh, and not much later posed for a commemorative photograph uh, by William Downey. Uh, and you can see this photograph here. She was dressed like a widow. She was dressed in her widow's weeds, but trimmed with ermine, a very expensive fur with very royal connotations. And her um, collaboration with William Downey continued in 17... Uh, in 1879, Downey Studio received the Royal Warrant, it means a special stamp of approval from the Queen, uh, and their official Diamond Jubilee photograph of 1897, celebrating the 60 years on the throne, was by the Queen's command excluded from copyright and allowed free circulation. So uh, this is unprecedented. The Queen allowed her official Diamond Jubilee portrait to be used for whatever purpose anyone wanted to use it. This is the moment when she enters as a logo as a brand and uh, this is the image that is very often copied in uh, all kinds of um, advertisements as you will see in a moment. So according to the historian David Canadine, the turn of the 20th century was the heyday of what he calls the invention of tradition. This is the title of the book in which he um, placed an article. Uh, that is the intensification of the popular acceptance of the image of the monarch as a symbol of national unity. During Victoria's reign, the royal pomp and ceremony were perfected so much that the British public started to believe in the fiction of the ritual's far-reaching historical prov provenance, even despite copious evidence to the contrary. The Queen's golden, 50 years, and diamond, 60 years, uh, jubilees were arguably, arguably among the most memorable moments of popular celebration of the monarchy in British history in general. The Queen reappeared in the public eye, eliciting displays of loyalty, even veneration from her subjects. And the specific way of functioning of the royal image of the late Victorian era was advertising. It was another new invention, another newly made industry, which Queen Victoria exploited, but also one by which she was exploited. So it goes two ways. Victoria uses advertising to popularize her image through allowing the circulation of her official photograph, but the industry of advertising exploits her to sell anything. Before mid-century, the majority of advertisements appeared in the form of print type without illustration. Sometimes, uh, sometimes also simple drawings or, um, or prints, but the illustrations come later. However, between 1850 and 1880, a combination of factors, mostly technological, new techniques in illustration, the recognition also of the expansive middle class market, the rise of the press, the abolition of the advertising taxes, and the professionalization of technical and creative assistance resulted in what is called uh, sometimes the advertising craze, which made ample use of illustrations and photographs. The Queen probably did not expect that the face from Downey's photograph would appear in press advertisements and on packages of such products as, among many others, tailoring fabrics, citrus fruit, as you can see, mustard, cocoa, porridge, whiskey, soap, so kind of foods, um, but also metal polish, portable cooking stoves, uh, and even bicycles appropriately branded Monarch. And you can see some illustrations here of all these products. Um, if you um, do a little Google search, you'll find more. So here we have Queen Victoria selling these, uh, these things, foods, drinks, soap, but things like cooking stoves and bicycles. She never cooked, she never rode a bicycle. Some of the 
products that used Queen Victoria for advertising purposes employed references to her name or the royal warrant to signify that she was included among the company's satisfied customers. During her reign, the Queen and her family granted an unprecedented number of over 2,000 royal warrants. This is the it's still used by the royal family today, so um, producers of uh, various, various products can apply for this official stamp of recognition. Uh, of course, the manufacturers used the royal symbols in advertising to imply high quality of their products by, and by um, uh, by the association of uh, uh, with the royalty. Some others employed the Queen's face as they did with many other famous people like poets, uh, novelists, actors, even without the consent of the person in question. So the, the legal side of copyright was not yet very well developed. Uh, Queen Victoria became not only a monarch but a celebrity in a very modern sense of the word. The new image tried to reconcile the paradoxes of monarchy. It was a conglomerate of the traditional royal dignity by the grace of God and a democratic monarchy by the decree of the people. The unreachable and exalted queen was at the same time an ordinary looking woman in perpetual mourning. She did not pretend to be a heroine of popular imagination. On the contrary, she passionately worshipped her chosen hero, that is, her dead husband. Similarly, the majority of products advertised with her image were things of everyday use, popular mostly in middle-class homes. Obviously, the Queen never spent time deciding which brand of porridge or cocoa to purchase. She never cooked or cleaned. Still, her image ennobled these mundane occupations performed predominantly by women, mind you, and also made them appear more patriotic. On the other hand, it confirmed the adherence of the sovereign herself to the bourgeois ideals of thrift, responsibility and hard work. On the other hand, the choice of the products marked with her face and name attested for the loyalty of her subjects. So here we have the imagery of patriotism and family values, so some of the more important values of the Victorian period. Uh, the Queen embodied two of the most important Victorian institutions, the government and the family. She was promoted both as a great sovereign and the great mother and the grandmother. The, uh, the subjects of her empire were equated with her biological children. Some advertisements include an exotic mixture of races and costumes to endorse the image of the empire as one big happy family with the queen maternally presiding over a multitude of young, healthy and dutiful peoples. The armed forces would have contributed to conveying a reassuring and reliable associations for the customers. And here we have again some uh, some examples of Victoria as the mother of the empire. <clears throat> some adv uh, advertisements, as you can see here, the Jubilee ad for Sunlight Soap, a very popular uh, brand of soap, did not even include the image of the product. Only the shields representing the principal colonies, the national symbols like the Union Jack or the Royal Standard, the crown and two pictures of Victoria. The British way of life, with its consideration for hygiene, its food and drink, became equated with patriotism. The Queen, presented as a demanding guardian of high quality, was identified also as a keeper of a certain lifestyle. Uh, so, if we talk about popular culture and the way popular culture uses images, especially um, <clears throat> images appealing directly to the public. It both shapes the public's attitudes and reflects them. This is a very interesting theoretical question. To what extent the public is shaped by the advertising and to what extent the advertising only reflects what the public likes anyway. This is not true only about the advertising, about all of popular culture, as you will see in different courses here at the Institute. 
So the growth of the middle class market and the rapid development of the advertising industry paved the way for an increasingly consumer culture. Uh, here we have um, another quotation from a book by Thomas Richards, uh, who says that Victoria's transcendent presence both legitimated consumption by women by offering them the Queen's stamps of a, a stamp of approval and to lure even more women into department stores by leading them to believe that they too would be treated like royalty. So the customer is the Queen, especially the woman being a customer. Advertising unmasked the duality inherent to the Victorian home, viewing it as a temple of virtue and at the same time as a centre of consumption. Many examples from late Victorian advertising show the Queen surrounded by her family in her roles of a mother and grandmother. Some products suggest that, like infant soothers containing opium, yes, they were giving opium to babies to make them sleep. Cocoa, starch, addressed, of course, these products uh, um, uh, as they were to predominantly female buyers, they propagated not only the supposedly modern technological answers to their, their, to their daily problems with baby care, cooking and cleaning, but glorified the Victorian attitudes concerning gender roles. Queen Victoria was viewed not only as an expert but a discerning eye for quality who always assumedly chose the best of convenience foods and cleaning agents but also as a guardian of female morality who vouchsafed that the use of convenience products in middle class homes would not endanger the virtue of bourgeois female angels in the house. This is a very Victorian phrase. A woman was supposed to be the angel in the house. Even at the early stages of the industry, advertising sold ideology, not just goods. So look at the uh, examples here of Victoria being a mother, a grandmother and expressing her concern for her family by buying, apparently, using certain products. Queen Victoria fulfilled her market potential perfectly. She became an incarnation of Britannia, regal yet homely, imperious yet motherly, someone with whom the British could, uh, someone whom the British could admire and with whom they could identify. She ruled because she represented her subjects and she represented her, uh, them because she was like them, although she was like them because they followed her example. So it's a kind of circular logic here. Uh, in time, Queen Victoria came to be perceived as nostalgic, even endearing, a cherished old relic of the past when life was supposed to be simpler, products more natural and corporations more honest. Uh, of course, adver advertising is not the only way that the image of Queen Victoria was used. Here we have some examples of everyday products with uh, images of Queen Victoria, so some commemorative, uh, uh, commemorative uh, cups and spoons and um, other souvenirs mostly of her, uh, of her jubilees. And the last few images I would like to show you are from modern times. Two from the, uh, from the 1970s and one from uh, 2011 of advertising actually using the image of Queen Victoria still to sell what looks to be luxury products. So either chocolates like here, or alcoholic drinks, like um, Bombay gin with the image of Queen Victoria on the label. So here it is supposed to be like a birthday cake for the Queen. Um, so uh, here we have a press advertisement reminding the public that May the, 20th, uh, the 24th is Queen Victoria's birthday. So one more occasion to drink gin with her image on it. And here we have um, a very, well, recent, um, 10 years old um, advertisement. Uh, this, is, this is a picture I actually took on the London Metro, uh, the, the underground, uh, of uh, a brand of whiskey with the image of Queen Victoria 
and uh, a slogan, Whiskey Fit for a Queen. So, um, why Queen Victoria? Is she a charming old lady now? Um, here, uh, the chocolates um, used this phrase that uh, um, is very often associated with Queen Victoria, we are not amused. Apparently she said that at some point and it became like the motto of her life. Probably not true, but anyway. And here she eats a chocolate and says we are vastly amused. So something to make this grumpy old woman appreciate the little pleasures of life or something to refer to the good old days when, um, I don't know, the quality of products was better and the corporations were more honest. So that's it, just to give you a little taste of what's to come during your studies. I hope you spend a wonderful time here, I hope you learn a lot and I'm really looking forward to meeting you all, either in person or in some um, upcoming um, online courses. Let's see how it goes. All the best. See you. Goodbye.